Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The program is about to begin. Please direct your attention to the stage. Thank you very much. My ancestors were enslaved at Monticello. Generations of people bound to the earth by blood and by law. I'm Gail Jessup White. Why a summit about race at Monticello? Jefferson, who wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, owned 600 men, women, and children over his lifetime. When he died 50 years later, families he owned were auctioned right here on these very grounds. Many were my relatives, including my three times great-grandfather, Peter Hemmings. It's that family story and hundreds of others that would have been lost had it not been for Monticello's years-long commitment to unearthing the complete story of the enslaved people who lived at Monticello. In spite of their bondage, this is where they created the best lives they could under circumstances that most of us find completely unimaginable. This is where they considered home. Thanks to the remarkable work of Cinder Stanton and her colleagues, we know more about the lives of the enslaved and their descendants than most other historic sites. Had it not been for Cinder, I wouldn't be standing here today. Thank you, Cinder. We are witnesses to a story similar to that of so many African Americans whose own ancestry has been lost. Unlike Gail, my connection to Monticello only goes back to 1968. That's when I first came here to work, and it was a time when a visitor could get the idea that Jefferson lived alone on this mountaintop. <laughs> so I have seen a lot of change. And now, thanks to decades of archaeological and historical research, visitors know Jefferson had some help up here. But also, we realized that we were getting only one side of the story from Jefferson's records. So in 1993, the Getting Word Oral History Project was begun to seek out descendants of Monticello's African-American families and get their perspective on life at Monticello. <laughs> This was a 20-year adventure for me, a real life-changing experience. I and my two African-American colleagues, Diane Swan Wright and Beverly Gray, have interviewed more than 200 people all over the country, and I'm so happy to see some of them here today. What we learned from the descendants has really transformed the way we talk about enslaved families who lived here and how we talk about Jefferson. So what do the stories of the enslaved and their descendants have to do with race relations today? Everything. People who don't know their history and culture are like a tree without roots. Slavery is part of that history, some of it rooted here at Monticello. Slavery and its consequences, including Jim Crow, segregation, and disenfranchisement, continue to cast a shadow over every American. It impacts how we live, and too often, how we die. Monticello is a fundamental place to understand our country's difficult history and to inspire us to live up to our greatest ideals, in Jefferson's own words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have learned of a brave, resourceful, and determined people, but Monticello's African Americans and their descendants lived in a nation of unfulfilled promises. Over and over again, we heard of descendants joining in the front lines of the fight to fulfill the promise of Jefferson's words in the Declaration. I have been so inspired by the people from both the past and the present that I've met along the way. Underground railroad workers, Civil War soldiers, hardworking farmers and teachers, women who integrated streetcars, founders of schools and churches, protesters, some of them on a heroic scale, like William Monroe Trotter, civil rights activists, and more. 
and they tell much more than just their own stories. They shine a light back into the shadows of slavery and give us a clearer view of the human dimension of the community whose lives and accomplishments went mostly unrecorded. A cruel system and society did not stop them from transmitting skills and a rich culture, sustaining their churches, and doing everything they could to safeguard their families. After the Civil War, millions of former slaves and their descendants migrated north, including my grandmother, Eva Robinson Taylor. We lost touch with our extended family, and had it not been for Monticello, Getting Word, and Cinder, those connections would have been gone forever. Instead, descendants, many meeting for the first time, and some sitting among us right now, have found their home again and have found reunited a place at Monticello. It's a perfect place to discuss a history that has divided us and to seek opportunities that can bring us together. An 11-year-old boy stood here on a bitterly cold day in January 1827. I knew nothing of the horrors of slavery until Jefferson's death, he later said. Then suddenly, I was put on an auction block and sold to strangers. Peter Fawcett gained his freedom 25 years later and joined his family in Ohio where he was a revered minister and very successful caterer. He often spoke of the beauty of Monticello and made the journey back here to see it again 17 years after leaving it on an auction block. Others made that same journey and one descendant told us, my grandmother talked to me about the beauty of Monticello and the ugliness of slavery. This mountaintop with all its contradictions is a fitting place to talk about slavery and freedom, about Jefferson's legacy, and about the legacies of the people who dreamed of the future just as passionately as he did. Our hope is that you leave here with a greater understanding of how slavery shaped much of our country's history, and that you'll walk away with a feeling of hope for the future, knowing that the American dream belongs to all of us. Thank you. Thank you.